Good afternoon to everybody. Wonderful to be with you. Um, so I, today I'd like to, uh, would like, like to learn uh, together um, this very enigmatic uh, passage that whenever we get to it in the Torah, lots of people, they kind of, it's hard to figure out what it's about, what's it doing. Um, and specifically, uh, there's a lot of ambiguities in the text uh, that are very unclear. Um, we'll touch on some of them. Um, and, but again, I just want to kind of get to what I think is uh, the Shuto Shel Mikra, the plain sense of the text, and what this very enigmatic story is doing. So let's just read the story. In front of you, if you have a Tanakh, you have a Tanakh. It's uh, in Perek Dalid. Uh, I have it printed here. Uh, Pasuk Chaf Dalid. Uh, we'll go back to some of the, some of the background, uh, which is probably the key to understand this in a minute. So the text says, um, in Pasuk Chavdalet, Vayhi baderech ba malon, and it was that Moses and his family were on the road. They're on the road to Egypt, ba malon, which is an interesting term, uh, malon. It's not ba bait, it's not ba sukkah, it's ba malon. Today in modern Hebrew, of course, the word malon means a, a, an inn or a, a hotel, but you know, what exactly it means. It certainly has something to do with the word lalun, to sleep over. So they got to a place where they slept over. Vayif gishehu Hashem. And God encountered him, confronted him. It's a very interesting term. Vayivakesh hamito. And he wanted to kill him. So first of all, there's a couple of ambiguities in the text. First of all, who's the him? Because we have Moses and his family. So it's not Sipora, it's not the wife, but it's some male. So it could be uh, Moses, it could be Moses' first son, Gershom, who we met in chapter 2. Uh, maybe it's Moses has another son, who we haven't met yet in the biblical text, which who we will meet later on in the Bible, in uh, Parshat, um, uh, you know, later on uh, in Parshat, um, Yitro will meet a child named Eliezer, but it's unclear. What's also unclear is what does it mean, Vayif Geshehu, God encountered him. Also, what does it mean that God, the divine being, encounters a human being? This is very problematic, especially for those who, like us, are Maimonidean, even if we don't want to admit it, we are so. Maimonidean in our, we've been brought up, the idea that God uh, encounters a human being um, sounds much too, um, pass the Makoro, um, you just put some over there, um, thanks. So the idea that God encounters a human being is very strange. In fact, it was so strange that many of the early translations of the Bible, as they are wont to do, they don't like Hag Shama. They don't like the idea of corporeality to God. And so they immediately add into this Vayif Kishehu Malacha Da Hashem. And the angel of God met God. Now it doesn't say that in the biblical text. It doesn't say that. And the Bible is very silent on Vayivake Shamito. And ostensibly God wanted to kill him. Why does God want to kill him? So it turns out that this encounter is not a friendly encounter, it's a very negative encounter. Why does God want to kill um, Moshe Rabbeinu? In general, why do you want to kill somebody? I mean, Moshe is a good guy. Moshe is Moshe. <laughs> he just has been given the job to take the Jewish people out of Egypt. So mapitom, that you're... This, so this text uh, really is troubling. It's ambiguous. It's troubling. It's not clear what it's doing, etc. The text continues, Vatikach Tsipora Tsor. Tsipora took a flint. She took a tsor. Maybe there's a little play on the word Tsipora and tsor. Um, doesn't say cherev, doesn't say, tsip, you know, Tsipora. Take out the pay and the hey, maybe. Vatichrot et orlat bina, and she cut off the foreskin. Vataga liraglav, and she touched his feet. Who's the his feet? Again, I'm not. Feet can here either be re literally the feet, or it could be a euphemism for the genitals. 
uh, something else, the procreation, who knows exactly what it is, but, um, but who's touching what feet? She's obviously doing the touching, but Vatomer, and then she makes this strange declaration, Ki chatan damim atali, vayiref mimenu, she makes this declaration of, you are the blood, we use the word chatan as a groom today, but who knows what the word chatan in original biblical Hebrew could have meant just a relative, you are my kinsman, you are my relationship, you are my bridegroom, it could be, of, of blood, vayiref mimenu, so God, uh, stopped, went away from him, um, and she repeated, it's a very ambiguous, very strange story, um, not exactly clear what the Bible is, is, uh, is doing here, and how should we interpret um, what's going on. So, if you look in some of the early readings of this Bible, so some of the earliest readings that we have are from uh, non-Rabbinic sources, but we, what we call Second Temple sources. One of those is the Book of Jubilees, Sefer HaYovlim, which was discovered in the, um, in the Qumran Caves, in uh, the, what we call the Dead Sea Scrolls. And this book is what is part of the genre called the rewritten Bible, Hatanach um, HaMeshuchzar, which is an attempt to kind of rewrite the Bible with all kinds of interesting insertions, what we would call Midrashim interpretations, reflecting the traditions of the Qumran cave Jews who were, again, we didn't live then, so we don't know exactly how mainstream or not mainstream they were, but they are a window into ideas that were floating around. So in the book of Jubilees, chapter 48, it says, And you did return into Egypt in the second week, in the second year, in the 50th Jubilee. And you yourself know what he spoke unto you on Mount Sinai, and what Prince Mastema, Mastema from the word in Hebrew, Satan, or Mista, you know, like, Vaistom Esav ala Bechora, Yaakov ala Bechora, hate. He's a demonic, hateful angel, a little pitchfork, right? The good, the good place. Desired to do with you when you were returning to Egypt on the way, when you did meet him at the lodge. So already in the book of Jubilees, the, the moving away from God to the angel, but it's not Stam, it's not Gavriel, it's not those nice angels we sing about, Shalom Aleichem, it's bad angels. It's the demon. Did he not with all his power seek to slay you and deliver the, and deliver the Egyptians out of your hand when he saw that you were sent to execute judgment and vengeance on the Egyptians? And I delivered you out of his hand, and you did perform the signs and wonders. So in this reading, it's kind of what we would call in Kabbalah the Sitra Achra, the, the evil side that wants to stop God's plan, which is an amazing reading because it's a total rereading of the text. Because the text, see how bothered they were. How could it be that God wants to stop? God just appointed him. What's God stopping him for? So you have this demonic angel that decides to try to stop God's plan, the Satan. Again, it's a fascinating reading. Obviously, it leaves us with our tongue hanging out as, that's not pshat. Um, that's not the simple uh, sense of the word. Again, I use the word pshat. Um, if I wanted to I'd give a whole two-hour lecture, what does the word pshat mean, of course, is obviously up in, you know, what does the word pshat mean? It certainly doesn't mean the literal translation, because uh, many times the pshat is not the literal translation. For example, a pasuk, um, right? Nechama Levit Zichronali Vracha would love to quote the pasuk, "Umaltem et orlat levavchem," and you shall, you know, you shall, you know, circumcise, circumcise your heart, the covering of your heart. It doesn't mean everybody has to have a bypass operation. It's just a, it's a phrase, right? When I was a kid, they used to. When we watched Bugs Bunny, so there's one, there's one uh, scene where Bugs is uh, unc uh, Grandpa Bugs, and he has his little kids on his lap, and he says, and, and he's telling a story, and it started raining cats and dogs, and cats and dogs start raining, in, you know, because it's a cartoon, but in the real world, it doesn't mean cats and dogs, hopefully, hopefully we all know that. So it's just a phrase. So really, you know, Nechama also used to make a joke that, you know, Pshat is what Pshat is what I say, drash is what you say. You know? <laughs> that was the joke that she used to make. But it does, Pshat has certain, in this context, I mean, what does the plain sense of the text 
filling, fitting in with the context, with rationality within the rationality of the Bible. The Bible is not a you know, kind of Cartesian rationality, but within the context of the story, the narrative, grammatically, historically, and how it was understood by that first generation that heard it. So that's a pretty big, tall order. So, okay. So, so the Book of Jubilees reflects, but again, a certain tradition, and I mentioned to you, um, the Targum Unculus says, Bahava ba'archa, they were on the road, Bebeit mibata, va'araba malachad Hashem. The angel of God tried to say, but it's not a negative angel, it's just the angel of God. So it's not this negative. And so, so what is going on in, in, in the story? So, so one approach, um, so there's basically, if you, if you look at it, and it will, you know, there's kind of four approaches uh, out there in the ancient exegetes, exegetes um, to try to unpack this. One approach is to say that, um, and I think the Rashbam, also in the Jewish world, says, um, yeah, says this explicitly. Vayifkeshehu Hashem hamalach, Rashbam also, even though he's Mr. Pashtan, he also goes down the route that it has to be an angel, it can't be God himself. That Moshe Rabbeinu was a little bit lazy. He didn't want to go. We know that Moshe didn't want to go, right? He constantly fights with God and he says, I don't really want this job. And God has to twist his arm to say, yeah, you're going to do this. So he didn't really want to do this. I think that's what the Rashbam is driving at. He was kind of schlepping out, oh, I have to get my kids, I have to get, yeah, they have to get out of school. It's hard. So he's being punished. Again, the Rashbam sees this as some sort of, of punishment for what he's, what he's doing. Um, and, and if you look, um, you know, we can, we can, we can see that, um, we can see that, you know, in, in, in another way. If you look in the second page, the Shadal, Shadal, Shlomo David Lutzato, he writes towards the bottom of the page, um, he says, Moshe Rabbeinu didn't tell his, his children what exactly he was going back for. They would have said, what, what are you doing? Um, don't go back there. And so he says, and if you look on the third line from the bottom, when they would get back, he says in the line before, they, don't, they knew nothing. And his older son, when he saw, when they got to Egypt and saw what Moshe was planning, that they would try to stop him. They were afraid that they would be, they would, you know, pay the price um, for what happened. It was bad in Moshe's, in, in God's eyes, that... You know, this is something that Moshe Rabbeinu was doing. So in this reading, um, that, you know, again, uh, there's a kind of mistake that Moshe makes because he brings his, his wife and children, either because he's taking too long, the Rashbam, or his wife and children. Then you have others who, again, see this as some sort of sin of Moshe Rabbeinu. Um, you know, some sort of sin of Moshe Rabbeinu because of the milah, right? That's the one that we're most familiar with, the Brit milah, that Moshe Rabbeinu didn't, didn't circumcise his son. Why didn't he circumcise his son? And again, this assumes a certain reading, that the, the person who's not circumcised is the child. Then you have to ask which child. And that Moshe Rabbeinu, now why did Moshe Rabbeinu not circumcise his child? So Rashi and the classical before him say he was scared. You know, they're going into the, they're going on the road. They're not going to heal well. Going to get sick, right? I think is now what Rashi, Rashi writes uh, on this uh, pasuk. Lefi shelo mal et Eliezer beno va'al shen nitrashel 
Ne'enash b'mita, because he was lazy, he, not lazy, but he was not careful about Brit Milah, he was punished. Tanya, Amar Rabbi Yossi, chasson lo nidoshel, it wasn't that he was lazy. Ela Amar, emol ve'itzei l'derch, sakana, it's pikuach nefesh. It's sakana. So this reading is a very kind of gentle reading. Moshe Rabbeinu made a mistake, and that's why this whole happened. But you send an angel to kill you? <laughs> so there's an amazing reading of the Mechilta. I want to show you. You can read it also in English, the translation. I'll just read it in Hebrew. Again, I just want to show you as the setup how far certain readers were willing to go because they were so puzzled by the story. I mean, this is crazy. <laughs> you don't teach this to kids in school. Listen to this one in this Midrash. Moshe said, so Moshe is a big tzaddik. If you look in the second line of the Mechilta, of Rabbi Shmuel on, on the first page, number four. Second line. Amar Moshe, Moshe said, the whole world are idolaters. I'm going to be a monotheist. What happened? When Moshe Rabbeinu wanted to get married to Tzipora, Amar Lo Yitro, this is Mamish not in the text, this is total. Okay, you can marry my daughter, but you have to. You have to go into the family business. Amarlo Mahu, what is it? Amarlo Ben Shielachatchila Yela Vodazara. Your first child has to be part of the cult of Midian. Has to be Avodazara Nick. You have to send them to, you know, St. Mary's of the Holy Cross, whatever. I don't know, whatever you want to call Avodazara. Mikan Ve'elach, but every child, we'll do a split. The first child is Avodazara Nick. The second child, you can send them to MDS. Mikan ve'elach l'shem shemayim. We're on the west side, right? Mikan ve'elach l'shem shemayim. Or yeshiva ketana. V'kibel alav. And Moshe Rabbeinu accepted this bargain. Wild. Amar lo hashbe aliv. Ha'ishba lo shenemar vayoel Moshe. Ein ala ela l'shon shua. It's a play on words. Vayoel Moshe means he began to stay with him. But they take the word vayoel and they turn it into ala. From the word ala, like with the sota. She has to take an Allah. Vayoel Shaul at home. Uchtiv. It says, Vayomer Naaman Hoel Vikach Kikarim. Lafikach, therefore, he kdim Hamalach, Larog Moshe, Miyad, Vatikach Tsipor Tsor, Vatikrot, the Torlat Bina. And therefore, Moshe, you know, the, you know, Tsipor said, no, 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 no. We're not going to do this. We are not going to. That's the earlier part of the Midrash that Rashi cites. Rashi ignored that part. Again, for those who think that Rashi is just a reader's digest of Midrash, no, he has a, he has a way. He's choosing amongst the various opinions, and he leaves out this very negative reading of Moshe Rabbeinu. Very negative reading. Again, to me, again, to me, it's just such a, it's such a wild idea that... He would do this in this way. Um, the Midrash would go that far. Again, I just want you to set all this up for what I think is the most compelling reading, which many um, have noticed, especially modern readers, have noted um, a lot of these points, um, including um, Professor Nachum Sarna, Zichron Oli Vracha, um, and many others who have written on this, as well as others who, you know, you can constantly find new things. So the key to really understand this passage is to go back to context, right? I kind of dropped you in the middle of the story, but the truth is the story is much larger and has tremendous, um, has tremendous uh, background that we have to unpack. So let's try to unpack it. So let's go back to source number one. Remember what have we been doing with God and Moses have been arguing um, about, right, about the situation. Uh, Moses doesn't want to go, he doesn't feel he's, you know, he's worthy, and God has to convince him with otot, with signs, and, and finally says, you know, Moshe says, anikvad peam, right? And God says, misam, you know, who gave the power of speech to anybody? It was God. And then God says, now it's time to go. And then the Bible tells us Moshe goes to his Father-in-law, pasuk yudchet, vayelech Moshe, vayashev el yeter chotno. Moshe returns to his father-in-law. Vayomalo el chana vashuv el achay shemitzayim. Let me go back. Ve'ereha odam chayim. 
Let me see if they're still alive. Notice, interesting, Moshe does not say what he's going to do there. We don't really, we ever notice that, but Moshe never says, you know, I'm going to fight with Pharaoh. He just says, I want to go on a bikur, I want to visit my, uh, my mishpacha in Mitzrayim. Vayomer Yitro Moshe Lech Shalom. Go, I'm sorry? That's not what he says. He says he wants just to, to see, see if they're alive. The people who accused him of murder. No, he says, El Achai Asher Mitzrayim, to my brothers. Oh, okay. I think that at this point he's, uh, you know, I think it's what he says. God is the one who's, you know, let's get to that. Go in peace. Which, of course, I think is a wonderful thing because to go in peace and yet the next day you're almost killed is a kind of, it's a wonderful little play here. God now speaks to Moses a second. God has already sent Moses on his way, but now God says again, you can now go back because all the people who are trying who are trying to kill you have died. Now again, who is the people who are trying to kill you? Probably it could be one of two. It could either be Pharaoh or it could be those people who told Pharaoh about him. Interesting, the term is only used three times in the Bible, that phrase, and it's used once before in Shemot. Uh, Perek Bet, where the Bible, when Moses gets into trouble, so it says, that's why I think it's Pharaoh, Vaishma Paro et Adavarazet, chapter 2, verse 15, Vaishma Paro et Adavarazet, Vayevakesh, Vayevakesh, Laharog et Moshe, Vayivrach Moshe, Bnei Paro, Vayeshev Eretz Midian. So the simple reading is it's a reference to Pharaoh, especially because Pharaoh dies. In chapter 2, verse 23, and Melech Mitzrayim dies. So the simple reading is God is saying that Pharaoh is dead. He doesn't have the same. So now they're ready to go. He takes the staff. All of a sudden, God interrupts. Again, third time. He sent him already. Then he sends him again with. The knowledge that Pharaoh is dead, which is a kind of play on what, what Yitro said, Lech le shalom, go in peace, everything's hunky-dory, you're gonna, be, you're gonna go and be successful, and everybody who tried to kill you is dead, so you're bishalom. But now God interrupts and says, no, no, no. He won't send the people. I'm going to harden his heart. And at this moment, already at the beginning of the story, you shall say to Pharaoh, or we can interpret it as, at some point you're going to say to Pharaoh, in order for this to be successful, Ko amar Hashem, b'ni b'chori Yisrael. My, Israel is my b'chor, is my firstborn. Va'omar elecha, shalach et b'ni v'ya'avdeni. Send, let my people go. Not send my people, let my people go to serve me. V'temein l'shalcho, hinei hanochi horeget b'ncha b'chorecha. I'm going to kill your firstborn. So the framing of our story is in the context of Moshe being allowed or go back to Egypt because all those who wanted to kill you, which is the same phrase, are done, and you can go, so ostensibly you're going in peace. But you should tell him, if you don't let them, there's going to be death. And there's going to be which death? Specifically the death of your firstborn because Israel is my firstborn. B'ni b'chor Yisrael, so midah keneged midah, I'm going to kill your firstborn. In that context, we have the story. Vayhi baderech b'malon. And it was on the way to the malon. Interesting, I started this year with why malon? Is it a play on the word mal? Is it a play on dafka? It doesn't say bayit o sukkah or anything else, but it's a foreshadowing. And they were on the way, they stopped. Hashem, Hamito. The third time, 
in the Bible that the phrase levakesh lahamit is used in the context of death. So God, instead of killing the son of Pharaoh, is ready to kill the son of Moshe, which is fascinating, which is a play on, of course, the son of Pharaoh is Keneged, stands opposite Israel, which is the son of God, the firstborn of God, the firstborn of, and now the firstborn of Moses, which I think leads to the poss- certainly the strong possibility that we're talking about Moses' son, and it's the firstborn son of Moses, that he is going to be killed. Now, why is he going to be killed? The simple reading is not that Moses did anything wrong. There's nothing in the text. In fact, the text, I think, screams out, no. It's almost like, you know, everything is ready, right? God has his agent. Moshe has his, his marching orders. Moshe has been shown miracles. Yitro has given him permission, so he's not doing anything wrong. Um, you know, Be'ine Elohim Adam. And Yitro not only says that, but Lech Shalom. Everything is hanky dory. And all the people who want to kill you are done, except one person who wants to kill him, and that's God. God never dies. It's, it's, it's such a striking, it shatters the whole scene. The scene is a scene of peace, of ready to do your thing, and up in the middle, Dafka, God, wants to kill Moses or Moses' first son. Why? No, it doesn't say. And maybe that's part of the idea. Maybe, and here, I don't want to get to the, so much to the, as far as the Rashbam, but there's a certain kernel of truth. What God is saying maybe to Moses is, now you could say it in one of two ways. You could say it is that, you know, things are not going to go so smoothly when you get to Egypt. That's what he's basically saying. And I'm going to, sh- it's, I'm going to show you how that's going to, in fact, even in your own derech to Mitzrayim, it's not going to go smoothly. But more than that, there's a certain element. Again, you want to go with the Rosh Bam, go with the Rosh Bam. You don't want to go with the Rosh Bam, but the idea that Moses needs to learn very quickly and, and deeply that if you don't exactly do what God says, you're also on the chopping block, which is exactly what happens later to Am Yisrael. I want to now show it literarily. Look at the, let's read this very carefully. Vatikach tziporat tzor, tziporat took a tzor, vatichrot et orlat bina, which is very interesting, vatichrot, doesn't use the word mal. So malon is mal, but it doesn't say. Vatichrot, of course, is interesting because it echoes back to where Brit Milah originally was given, which is in Perak Yud Zayin. It says, lichrot Brit. The word lichrot originally is to cut a covenant in biblical Hebrew. Again, I'm not going into the old, you know, Josh Berman wrote a whole book about how you cut covenants in the ancient world and, and vassal treaties and all that. And Brit Ben Abitarim, you cut something and you walk through the middle and the two sides and all that stuff. Lichrot, Brit, is a biblical term. And to use it here means that there's something going on here beyond just the Mila. Mila is a form of here, of willing to sacrifice something on behalf of God, the blood. And she touched his. And if she didn't do that, Moshe or his son and her son are in danger. If you don't do, so to speak, the covenantal act, you are in danger. Not just Pharaoh is in danger, which is what God said to Moshe directly, but you too are in danger because what's Pharaoh supposed to do? He's supposed to listen to God to let them worship God. But if you are not willing to worship God fully, if you're not willing to put it, you're also going to do that. This is a foreshadowing of the night of Pesach. Specifically, let's t- turn to chapter 12 for those who have Tanakhs. And it's actually here on the page on number 7. Vayikra Moshe Lachem 
Vehigatem el hamashkof. This is a, an extremely rare use, use, excuse me, of this word. Vehigatem el hamashkof. You should take the blood of the korban Pesach, which is what God commands you to do as a sign that you are ready to leave Egypt and under the protection of God as opposed to under the thumb of Pharaoh? Are you willing to identify, again, you can make a whole drush about it. Are you willing to identify as part of the covenantal people? So here, you take the blood, vihigatem. It's a very rare, it doesn't, usually when you talk about blood, you talk about sprinkling blood. Lizrok, the zaraktem, says it hundreds of times in the Bible in terms of blood. Look back at chapter 4. It's very rare. Blood that touches something else. Blood, it's rare. It's, I mean, you can look in your concordancia. It doesn't happen. That's the point. And of course, both of them take place at night in the nocturnal story. And in fact, there are some who see here, you know, as an echo almost of the Jacob story. Remember Jacob and the nocturnal Ish, who also the rabbis turn into an angel. It's more, makes more sense there. Um, meaning before he encounters his real encounter with Esau, there's a kind of foreshadowing of an encounter, a nocturnal encounter before. Now, and there it's literally, the literary parallels are very clear that the next day when he meets Esau, it's very similar to the, to the experience that he had the night before in confronting. And, and so what happens is that you have, you have here a foreshadowing, which is mamish, the language of Chazal. We all know that. Um, and, and again, now Jubilees is not so crazy because this is what I call reverse intertextuality. Um, what's reverse intertextuality? We all know intertextuality. One story plays on another story, right? So the story of, um, I don't know, the story of, um, of, of, of Pilegesh Begiva, you know, plays off, uh, you know, the story of Sodom, or, you know, these kind of parallels. People, you know, make a living out of them. We all make a living out of them. Um, but sometimes the parallels go the other way, okay? Um, just to give you a, 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 an example that I always think is fascinating. The book of Job begins, Ish Hayab Eretz Utz. There was a man from uh, Eretz Utz, and he was, what is the first, you, you have a Tanakh, what is the first uh, line of the book of Job? You want to read it? Ishaya. The land of Oz. V'yirei Elohim, right? So, and then we have, of course, the whole story of the Satan. The Satan, etc., etc. Now, the Satan challenges, it says, you think he's so from, you think he's so this, give him this and see if he still, if he still recognizes God or he'll curse you. Okay, the Satan. The Satan only makes his appearance in biblical literature in the late books, like the book of Eov, the book of, um, you know, Zechariah, the second, you know, from, from a much later time in Jewish history. Of course, the Satan shows up all the time in rabbinic literature much earlier in history, right? Like so, for example. We're going to read it soon. And indeed, God tested Abraham. Says Rashi, Satan Satan said to Abraham, to God, you think Abraham is so from? Take away his son and see if it, that's a motif from the story of Eov that has been brought in to Abraham. But how did they connect it? Because it's very simple, because Eov is patterned on Abraham. Ish Hayab Eretz Utz. There's only one other place where the land of Oz is mentioned, which is, of course, right after the Akedah. Right? What does it say? At Utz Bechorah, right? Remember the whole list after the Akedah of who's born. 
it's Utz Bechorah, right, that uh, Rivka's family had, had a lot of children and, you know, and, and Avram just has Yitzchak. And number two, Ish Tam V'yarei Elohim, Abraham is Tamim T'yem Hashem Lokecha, and of course, Ataya Dati Kirei Elohim Ata, Abraham is the Yirei Elohim par excellence. So, and there are many, many other parallels, and the rabbis went crazy about that Eov is patterned on Avraham, etc. So if Eov is patterned on Avraham, so guess what? The rabbis felt if A equals B, B equals A. We go back in time also. So we can borrow motifs from later biblical books and put them in to early. That's classic. So I think the book of Jubilees said, well, if the night of Pesach, it says, V'lo yitain ha-mashchit, it's not God, it's God, but in the biblical story, there is a mashchit, a negative angel. I wouldn't call him a demon, but what's a mashchit? Someone comes and destroys things, right? He's, right? In the story, what's the, where, what pasuk is it in? In, uh, in, in right? we have Bal, Balkori par excellence. In Shemot, what? I'm sorry, Parakut Bet. So God says, you know, put this all, yeah. Pasuk Perak Yud Bet, Pasuk Yud Gimel. Vayahadam lachem laot al habatim. Pasuk Yud Gimel. I should have included here. I'm sorry. I started too late. You should put the blood in chapter 12, verse 12. The avarti beeretz mitzrayim balai lazeh. Vikati kol bechor beeretz mitzrayim miadam vehad beima. I will go over and I'll kill every bechor in Eretz Mitzrayim. I will pass over you. I won't let the destroying angel, what we like to call the Malachamavis, right? Also Malachamavis. We say the night of Pesach. The Malachamavis. Malachamavis. Okay? He won't come. If you don't do this, if you don't express your avodah, right? God, in the Bible, it's not a negative. Va'avadatem et ha'avodah ba'layla zeh is a positive. Right? We turn it in the Midrash, oh, ma'avodah zot lachem is a negative. But it's, the whole point is, v'yavduni ba'midbar. Avadai heim v'lo avadim l'paro. That's the whole point. You are now servants of God rather than servants of Pharaoh. But if you don't do that, then you show that you don't want to leave Egypt and you don't want to, you don't want to mizdaheh, you don't want to identify as an Oved Hashem. If you don't want to identify as an Oved Hashem, then to use rabbinic language, the rabbis often got kevon shanitan rishut la mashchit la hashchit, eno mavchin. Once the malach hamavis is given free reign, there's no distinction, right? If you don't, if you don't connect yourself to use rabbinic terms and medieval terms, if you don't connect yourself to the hashgacha hapratit of God by connecting to God either intellectually, emotionally, then the norms of of life will will hit you and kill you. And if and when God says, "I'm allowing the most destructive forces to come," they're going to sweep you away as well because you are basically a mitzri. You're not an ivri. This story is basically that message to Moshe Rabbeinu that, yeah, you didn't do anything wrong. You didn't do anything wrong. Yeah, he was a little bit, but maybe except the fact that he was willing, a certain uh, hesitancy to take on the mission of Tavduna Telukim al Harazed, to take them out and bring them to. And so maybe there's an element of that, again, an element, but it's not like he did a specific, oh, bris milah, he did an Isser. That's not that he didn't do bris milah. It's brit milah, of course, represents the blood of covenant. On the individual level, Korban Pesach represents the blood of covenant. Again, I'm not going into what blood represents, in the but it clearly has some. And it's clear that the Bible connected the two on a literary level, because how does the end of, of Parshat Bo happen? What happens at the end of Parshat Bo? Moshe Rabbeinu, towards the end of chapter 12, um, after the actual... What happens? You have the destruction of the Bechor, of the firstborn, and then Moses tells the laws of Korban Pesach lidorot, forever and ever. The beginning of chapter 12, this is a classic thing in the Bible. You have the beginning, which is all about the laws of the Korban Pesach for that generation, what Chazal called Pesach Mitzrayim, the generation of Egypt. Then you have Pesach Dorot, 
It's from verse 43 on, chapter 12, verse 43. And you have all the laws of Pesach. Who can't eat a Korban Pesach? Someone who doesn't have a Brit Milah. So you have Korban Pesach, Brit Milah, and then how does Parshat Bo end? Vaidaber Adonai el Moshe Lemor, Kadesh li kol b'chor, peter kol rechem b'vnei Yisrael. You have the laws of the mitzvah of giving a b'chor. Which is of course, so it turns out you have a chiastic structure. You have the, in chapter 4, you have the themes <coughs> of b'ni b'chori Yisrael. Israel is my b'chor. And if you don't, I'm going to kill your b'chor. Then you have circumcision. Then you have circumcision, which is of and Korban Pesach together, the blood, which saves you. And then once again, you end with the laws of Bechor, which are supposed to remind you of the Bechor that was saved because you were different than Egypt. So you have chapter 4, the beginning, Bechor, Bechor Israel, circumcision, and Chazal, anyone who ever went to a Seder, knows that Chazal made a very... Chazal here are just reading the text. We all know the book of Joshua, chapter 5, that in chapter 5, in the book of Joshua, Giv'at Ha'aralot, right? The, you know, no one during the desert had been... Um, males had been Nimol, and they didn't do Korban Pesach for the entire 40 years. Korban Pesach, and of course Chazal, as many of us have learned, connected it from the famous verse in the book of Ezekiel. The book of Ezekiel, which we include the night of the Seder in chapter 16, which is a verse we say at a brit, we call it out in a brit. So Chazal say, what does it mean? Why twice? Zedam Mila. V'omerlach b'damai chayi. Zedam Pesach. The two are, in, and, and in the Bible, they're intimately connected, and halachically, we know that Brit Mila and Korban Pesach are the only two uh, mitzvot say the only two commandments, positive commandments, that you get cut off, which of course is the play on, if you don't do kritat Brit, v'nichrita ha-nefesh ahi, May Ameha, you will be cut off from the people. So if you don't do Krita Tabrit, if you don't, if you're not willing to enter into covenant, and of course, um, let me go a little further about this. You know, Brit Mila uh, represents, and again, I'm not going into the question of why God didn't give Brit Mila to women. Uh, you know, he didn't create that kind of uh, biology. Um, maybe he could have given some other thing. I don't know. You know, people, I think there was a book once that was called, Why Don't Women Get Brit Milah? There was, a, there was a book like that. Somebody many years ago wrote. It's a very interesting question. Why that was not, why that God didn't have, do it in his inscrutable uh, ways. But whatever it is, the, ba- the fact is that in biblical theology, Right, so the mitzvah of Brit Milah is entry into covenant for men on an individual level. Korban Pesach, and that's the first mitzvah that Abraham gets, right? Abraham, you know, as a, what we would call a mitzvah, you know, saying lech lechal artzcha is not, you know, you don't have to do that every year. <laughs> on the eight, this is something that's a perennial that you have to do every year and you have to do it to your children, Abraham is told, and because of that, you are being korate brit. So it's a covenantal thing. Korban Pesach is the same thing. It's a covenantal entry. And that's why, let me explain. Again, if we had more time, we could go into this. That's why so many interesting things happen with Korban Pesach in the Bible. For example, for example, there's a weird thing called Pesach Sheni. Very strange. You know, <laughs> you know if, I, um, if I was... Uh, in isolation with COVID during Sukkot. You know, it's Nebach, too bad, but I wouldn't ever think of asking, Ma Pitom, I should go and say, okay, in the middle of December, I'll sit in a Sukkah. And if, I mean, I'd be crazy. Not only I'd be crazy, according to Chazal, I violate an Isidar Isa of, lo, of Bal Tigra, I'm sorry, Bal Tosif, of adding to the mitzvot. You can't sit in a Sukkah in the middle of December. 
You can't light Hanukkah candles in the middle of June. So Mapitom, okay, so you were Tamela Nevshatam. To use rabbinic terms, onus rachmana patre, you're exempt. If you're sick, you can't do it. Mapitom, and not only do they have the chutzpah to ask, but God says, you know, you're right. And because the language is amazing. Lama nigara. Why should we be left out? If I don't sit in a sukkah on sukkahs, I'm not being left out of the covenantal re-experiencing of, of Pesach, of entry into covenantal relationship with God as a people, as a people. But if, but if I don't do Korban Pesach, Lama nigara, why should we be left out? We're left out. That's what the benotes left It's by. correct. That's a whole thing about Sefer Bamidbar. They also feel like you're left out of, our father's going to be left out of, because Anachala is to be part of the community and the people. And that's why you have an amazing Hava Amina. Right? Everybody knows what a Hava Amina is? Hava Amina is what I might have thought. It's an amazing thing. Sometimes you learn the most from Hava Aminas. It's one of the things we learn in Yeshiva. Certainly one of the things Rav Lichtenstein taught us. In the Parsh of Pesach Sheni, the Gemara says as follows. Uh, the, uh, Rashi cites it. It says, chem ger, that he does ke, ke chol mishpatav, or whatever. He should do exactly like every other Jew. Yelachem, one law. So you have this crazy Havamina. Yochol hamit gayer, yaase korban Pesach miyad, kamash malan. I might have thought that if somebody converts in the middle of June, he should do a Korban Pesach at that time. Kamash Malan. That, no, Chazal, the Torah says, no, you do it with the rest of the Jewish people. Such a crazy Avamino. I might have thought you do Korban Pesach in June? What is this, everybody does their own religion? Mm-hmm. You never find any Avamino like that. I might have thought, even, no, I, say, I might have thought you eat matzah. I might have thought you'd shake a lulav when you become, you should do all 613 that you missed. It's like a minchas chinuch about if you get bar mitzvah in the middle of right. Do you, do you continue? Right? Who ever heard of such a thing? But when it comes to korban pesach, korban pesach represents the entry into covenantal destiny of the people. It's the first mitzvah of the people. I, I know Chazal say the first mitzvah is is rosh chodesh. Hachodesh azelachem rosh chodeshim. But in pshat, it's not rosh chodesh. Hachodesh azelachem is just the intro into giving the laws of korban pesach. And that's why also, for those who like to study the book of Chronicles, for example, can I borrow your Tanakh for a second? Yeah. Um, thank you, I'm sorry. I should have wrote my own Tanakh, but I didn't think I would talk about this. But So we all know the great King Josiah. I love that name. I wish I had more kids. I would have named one of my kids Josiah. So the King Josiah, uh, Yoshiahu, so he was kind of the great white hope, to use a very on PC old term. Does everyone know what that phrase means? The great white hope? You ever heard that term? No? Somebody explain. It's a boxing term. A boxing term. A boxing term. Yes. He's going to be the, you know, like Larry Bird was the great white hope of basketball, you know, because he was a white player who kind of, you know, was able to play at that level. So Josiah was going to be, Josiah was one of the, so to speak, the last great hope of Israel. He was a very righteous king, etc. And he lives about 50 years before the Khurban Habayit, from the destruction. And in chapter 30, um, 34, there's a beautiful chapter that describes all of his things that he did. Um, it says that he did the following. It says that Ben Shmona Shanim Malach And he did he did the good in the eyes of God. When he was already 16, which means 8 plus 8, he was 8 when he became king, and eight, when he was 16, in his 12th year, it means he's 20, now he's a real man. He got rid of all of the all of the And then he calls and then, of course, is the famous story of cleaning out the Beit HaMikdash and discovering the scroll. Devarim. They, they, which according to some is Devarim, according to others is the entire scroll of the Bible. And they read it and they do Teshuvah. And they do all these things. 
and they read the brachot and the klalot, etc., etc. And what is the next thing he does right after this? He reads the book of the covenant, whatever it is, whether it's Devarim or the whole Torah. It's called the book of the covenant. They're reconnecting. It's a kind of hakel. They haven't, they've been about a Zaranix the whole time. They're reconnecting to God. They reconnect to do the Brit. Sefer Abrit reminds us of the Brit ceremony of chapter 24 of Mishpatim, where Moses read the Sefer Abrit. Brit, Brit, Brit. Beautiful. What's the very next Pasuk in chapter 35? Vayas Yoshiahu Birushalaim Pesach Ladunai. The only event that we're next told about is the Pesach. He must have done a lot of other things in the interim, but the next event that Divrayamim deigns to spend time and an entire chapter with that very beautiful verse, Velo Nasef Pesach Kamobi Israel Miyemei Shmuel Anavi. There had never been a Pesach like that since the time of Shmuel Anavi. It's like, whoa. It's like a Sukkot, Pesach, they never... Sukkot yeah, Sukkot Sukkot Sukkot. right. So you have here a juxtaposition of the reading of the Sefer Habrit, and immediately, what do you got to do? Pesach. It's like we become Geirim again. We're going to be Pesach. So, so this narrative is very... is it, it, a foreshadowing that, you know, all of Am Yisrael, the Bechorim, the, the young, the, the, the firstborn, they're in danger if you don't if you don't, if you're not willing to commit yourself to the Brit, which is symbolized by the Brit Milah, again, did he, maybe he was putter from doing Brit Milah. His son was too young. Or, or it was dangerous. Maybe that would have... But from the perspective of... And, and therefore it's a foreshadowing of Vatagal Raglav, the Dam, Dram Brit, and Dam Milah. And, and, but don't you have to deal with Sephora? Yeah. Because Moshe is not an actor in this. God doesn't speak to Moshe. God doesn't speak to anybody. Right. He's an attacker. Right. She figures out what to do. Right. And she figures out what to say mm -hmm. to end it. Correct. Now, either it comes from nowhere and it's purely literary right. to move to the next step. Right. Or it has to come Once from... Once I didn't finish, yeah. Somewhere. I agree with you. There requires more analysis. We have to give another shear about the role of Tzipora, but I don't have a good... Which off is why I said it at the end. Yeah. No, but I think, I think it's an important issue of how we play you know, Tzipora into this. Um, again, yeah, there's more, maybe more to say. Maybe it's the role of women in the Book of Shemot, which is a big issue. You know, Tzipora and Miriam, maybe it has to do with that. How they save their I mean, part of the. I love it because what you said earlier and, and the relationship of women without a bris. Right. Well, here you wouldn't have a bris without, without the woman. Without the woman. Yeah. I just want to close with What's there is one. What? One more. What's pshat? What do you mean, what's pshat? It's very clear. It's that the, the Bechor who, do, if you're not, it, it's not that there's a sin. It's a sta it's a statement that you have to be willing to make a commitment to God, which is represented by the blood covenant of Mila, and that's what protects you from all the dangers ultimately. Which is exactly what Am Yisrael are challenged to do. It's not exactly, but it's a foreshadowing of that experience. Who's gonna die? I'm sorry. Who was going to die? Oh, who was going to die? I think it's ambiguous. It may be. It could be Moshe. But it probably, it, who's also firstborn, it could be the, could be his son. I think it's Pshad is more that his son does. It was his son who was in danger. Because the whole context is B'ni B'chori Israel. If you don't kill, I'm going to kill your firstborn. And here Moshe, I think this context seems to play that. I just want to close with one thing. Right after this story, what happens? Pasuk Chavzayim. The inverse. Once you do this, what happens? Vayomer Hashem el Aaron. Lech likrat Moshe Amidbara, vayelech vayifgishehu. He meets Aaron. Same term. 
Behar Elohim. Now it's not in some malon. It's you make it. Tahar Elohim Vayishaklo. Instead of Vayimitei, who he gives him smooches, he gives him kisses. It's the exact opposite. And now and now you can be back on Haderech, so to speak, to actually then fulfill your destiny. And you, and you understand your responsibility as being an Oved Hashem, even with the challenges and willing, that's what will ultimately get you. One more thing, um, I guess, um, immersion to be like a precursor to the uh, covenantal right. relationship, uh, which for women works, and also for um, because Pesach works because that's what. Right. So, so the rabbis actually read. At, right. The rabbis actually read Matan Torah once they leave Egypt that they have they have immersion right mm -hmm. when they get ready for as part of the conversion brit process as well. Okay. Thank you very much for your hakshava. Yes.